talk to us about herbicide technologies for pasture weed control. And Scott's been very active in this area of work in Kentucky. So we're really pleased to have you, Scott. So I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Jamie. Can everyone hear me? Okay, that means the mic's working. Uh, so I'm going to try to channel Dr. Gary Lacefield today, and I'm going to talk really fast. So if you want to pick anything up, you, you, you better be listening. So uh, first of all, I want to give you my perspective on weed control, and this is going to tie into a lot what Chris talked about earlier. Now, I look at managing pasture production. I, I look at a certain order of operations that I want to achieve, and I put weed management up here at, at the top, and this is the reason why not because I'm the guy that works for the herbicide company. I, by the way, I do work for Dow DuPont, if you didn't pick that up. It's not because I work for the herbicide company. It's because everything else underneath this is affected by weed pressure. So if you have undesirable weeds in the field and you try to improve soil fertility, there's going to be some of that removed by undesirable weeds or weeds that, uh, that animals don't eat. In particular, uh, I come from Estill County. Don't hold that against me. Uh, it's the land of ironweed. All right. Hey, there's a Nestle County guy back there. Lee County. Lee, okay, close enough. Same. We could just merge borders and be fine. But, uh, you know, that's something that really takes a lot of nutrients away. Species selection. If you're going in and interseeding or overseeding or reseeding a pasture period, if there are weeds in there, that's going to compete for space. I tell people a lot of times, if, if you've ever bought land, if you've ever rented land, the cheapest piece of real estate you'll ever buy will be that acre that you gain on your own farm when you get those weeds under control because those are where you're going to end up growing these new grass species or expanding the current grass species that you have. And then grazing management is down there. I look at soil fertility, species selection, and grazing management as the one thing that gives you... Um, it puts that umbrella over top of weed control. It extends that weed control out over years. If you are applying herbicides on your farm, and get this, this is, the, <laughs> this is the guy from the chemical company. If you're applying herbicides in your pasture every year, you don't have a weed problem, you've got a grazing management problem, all right? We should be able to extend weed control out for two to three years minimum before we have to go in there and, and reset, the <clears throat> reset the clock. Now, I put this into practice on my own operation. I have a uh, small cow-calf operation right now and uh, outside of Lee Summit, Missouri, a little place called Holden, Missouri. I really stress this, forage. I want to control what I've got out there for my cows to eat. All right, I'm very adamant about uh, protecting my soil with good fertility, getting the weed control right, getting the species selection, and grazing management so I keep my pastures looking like this. Now, Michael's going to talk a little bit, little bit about uh, mowing. Chris talked a little bit about it, but I'm going to give you my perspective. Why not mow for control? Why, what's the deal with it? If you look at mowing for control, it's usually somewhere between $15 and $25 an acre, depending on who you're talking to, all right? Um, especially if you talk to an economist, right? They're going to tell you that uh, it's going to be somewhere around $15 to $25 an acre. Uh, herbicide, like if you use something like Grazon Next, it costs you about $10 an acre. Then you have application fees on top of that or surfactant. So you get up to uh, about the, the same, <clears throat> same level. But that's one herbicide application. How many of you are mowing two to three times a year? All right. That's where the big cost savings comes into to place. The other thing is, is we only have temporary results when we mow. You mow, you get the warm and fuzzies. You look out there and see that nice green field. A month later, the ragweed's up to your up to your waist. If you're going to get control of things, it usually takes two to three timely mowings a year for two to three years to get certain species under control and you're still not uh, getting control of them uh, completely. The other thing, and this one bugs me, this one really bugs me, is that when you go out and mow, you remove grazable forage. I want my cattle eating the grass. I don't want to cut it off and turn it into thatch on the ground. This is my operation. This is uh, in Holden, Missouri. I have a rotation, and you can kind of see how my rotation works. Sometimes I break pastures up into two or three acre blocks. Sometimes I have them down to an acre, but I'm constantly moving cattle. I try to move cattle every two days if possible. With that, I don't own a tractor. I do not mow. I do not own a tractor, and I, I do not intend to ever buy a tractor because by moving cattle that way, by controlling grazing, by controlling the weed pressure, this is the way my pastures look. I do not need a tractor, and I, I, if I have to buy a tractor, I can no longer afford to farm because I, I had to borrow money to buy that farm. It was, I did not inherit it. I had to borrow the money, so I have to make sure it pays for itself. So what is weed control? You know, weed control is different to, depending on who you talk to, and, and Michael and I talked about this earlier. Uh, 
you have weed control by some people. If they go out and they spray 2,4-D across uh, something like cockleburr and it burns it down, they're like, hey, I got 100% control of cockleburr. Some people call that weed control. Other people say, if I go out and make an application on cockleburr this year, I don't want to see it next year. All right? Now, here's the difference. If you put something like 2,4-D down by itself on cockleburr, you'll kill the standing cockleburr. But there are going to be more flushes of cockleburr usually later in the season, right? Have any of y'all ever seen this? You'll see other flushes. Residual herbicides a lot of times will hold that cockleburr out for a period of time and actually give you time to, uh, to, to get some repair. So some people define control in short, short term. What can I have in the next four to six weeks? Other people consider long term. What I'm going to have for the rest of the season or even this time next year. Um, so the differences in control vary depending on who you talk to. And that brings us into the, the importance. Now, I'm going to talk about specific recommendations here in a second on weed control, but there's, there's something you have to understand. You have to understand the difference between a, a herbicide that has soil residual activity and some that, ha that does not have soil residual activity. Now, the thing is, a non-residually active uh, herbicide, it can still be in the soil, all right? But the problem is, is that root uptake is usually insignificant or there's no uptake at all. Uh, you usually have short replant intervals, so if you apply something like 2,4-D and you want to come back in and put clover in just a, a few days or a few weeks after, there's usually no issue with that. <clears throat> it's, so it's ideal for uh, situations where you're, you're going in and taking care of the weeds and then you're doing something very quickly to go in and repair that stand or to put, um, put other species in there. Residually active herbicides, they remain in the soil for usually a significant amount of time. Uh, and root uptake is actually pretty significant, enough so that future flushes of weeds um, will, you, are usually inhibited. So take, for instance, uh, cockleburr. I have sprayed Grazon Next in April, and I have taken care of cockleburr the rest of the season. Not even a seedling of cockleburr come up in these fields. And I've done that actually at Eden Shell Farm last year, and um, I've never seen so many producers uh, scramble to find a piece of paper to write down the name Grazon Next on, <laughs> because of what they saw in that field. Weed control usually extended for a period of weeks or even months, depending on the, how sensitive that weed species is to the particular herbicide. They usually have longer replant intervals. And this is something I want to address. A lot of people are concerned about legumes, uh, killing legumes in their pastures. A lot of times, legumes, uh, after an application of some of these residual herbicides, can be replanted in four to six months. I uh, was in a field yesterday that I had treated with a strong residual herbicide last year, and the legumes had naturally come back. That was, that was yesterday. So a year after application, um, the legumes in that field were strong. I don't know when they started to come up. Maybe it was earlier this spring. But I have seen volunteer uh, uh, white clover and red clover come up six months after an application. The other thing about residually active herbicides is they're usually bound in plant cell walls. So if you were to try to compost, that material or manure, that it could end up uh, inhibiting the growth of a broadleaf plant. This is kind of the downside to using residuals. That manure, that hay that you compost and you put on your garden will kill your tomatoes or it will kill your, your um, uh, soybeans. So you have to be really careful uh, where you use residually active herbicides. So herbicides with no residual, usually short-term effects and uh, targets emerged plants only. When you get into herbicides with residual activity, it usually prevents future flushes of plants, giving you time to repair that, um, uh, that stand. The other thing is they're usually a little broader spectrum in control. Uh, they, they can really, something like picloram, which is not sold in Kentucky, uh, that active ingredient has been widely used out west for years, and it is a strong herbicide. We're talking about um, kills broadleaf weeds, kills trees, really packs a wallop. But these herbicides, these residual herbicides, they allow us, and I can't stress this enough, it allows you time to repair your pasture, all right? It holds out those broadleaf weeds until you can take over that real estate with something else. So we look at residual herbicides. I think they're effective solution for moderate uh, to low weed pressure. When you get into residual herbicides, those are when you've got significant weed pressure and there is a desperate need for, um, uh, for renovation. This is a great example right here. This is spiny pigweed. Some of you all have this. This is actually taken down in Georgia. We could not get this guy to spray this field because he had about 5% cover of white clover. He would not spray that field, all right? 
Uh, she says there's nothing wrong with that pasture. So, I'm, <laughs> so, so, do you know how many cattle have died in the Midwest from grazing, uh, taking on and, and grazing amaranth? We have lost herds, 30 and 40 animals at a time, because their kidneys shut down. They didn't fall dead there in the field, but two weeks after grazing, bam, dead. Pigweeds are a species that you and I are going to have to part ways on. We have, we have multiple cases in the Midwest where we have killed herds. Uh, red root pigweed is by far the number one. In all the literature you look at, red root pigweed is the one that tends to cause more animal deaths. I'm sorry, but there's dead cows to prove otherwise. huh? This is another field. We have a lot of brush species in this particular field. Uh, you've got other species in there. These are areas where if you want to regain that, turn it into more of a grass and then put in the clovers later in the season. This is where uh, those soil residual herbicides. This is something that you know I look at and I'm not too taken back by. The weed density is not that bad, but if you did want to come up in here, uh, and apply something, maybe a non-residual herbicide. The forage is in fairly good condition, and if we get, you know, can put these, push these back a little bit, we may be able to gain control of this field with something with a non-residual. So deciding what to apply. No residual activity. Things like 2,4-D. Dicamba has a little bit of residual activity, but I'm not going to sit here and hang my hat on it. Triclopyr. Glyphosate, saflufenacil, these are some common herbicides that you'll find in the range and pasture business. And they usually don't have enough activity to, to cause us any issues with future flushes of weeds or prevent those future flushes of weeds. Things with residual activity, aminopyrrolid, which is kind of the new kid on the block. Um, it's been around since about 2006, but it's really made a lot of waves uh, across the pastures. Clopyrrolid's been around for probably 30 or 40 years. Metsulfuron, it's, it's been around long enough that it is generic now, uh, has residual activity. Picloram has been around for 60 years. We've been using it in the Midwest for over 60 years now, and farmers still grab it um, to get control of certain weeds. And then Tebuthyron, which has various uses, but most notably it's used to, uh, to kill certain tree species. So let's talk about proper timing and treatment for broadleaf weeds. Common ragweed. Cattle eat common ragweed in the springtime of the year. They do. If you were to go out and scout your pasture, pull back the grass, you will find common ragweed growing out there as soon as, as middle of April. All right? So it's growing out there. Cattle will graze that, and they preferentially will graze that early in the season. The problem is, is as you get into summer, those plants become much less palatable, and they start ignoring them. You all have seen this time and time again. In the summertime, the cattle just all of a sudden, they stop grazing common ragweed. Non-residual herbicides uh, that are really good on 2,4-D is just lights out when it comes to working with something like ragweed. The problem is it doesn't always prevent those future flushes of ragweeds. But dicamba and triclopyr as well. Uh, Aminopyrrolid, clopyrrolid, and picloram are all residual herbicides that work really well on this. And I've seen multiple cases where products containing aminopyrrolid have been applied to ragweed and has actually prevented ragweed germination the rest of the year. So <clears throat> it ended it dead in its tracks. Tall ironweed. I told you I grew up in Mestel County. That is the land that's tall ironweed heaven. I've actually seen cattle use it for shade in the summertime. It got so tall. <laughs> I'm not kidding about that. I've seen them do it. <clears throat> 2,4-D and dicamba will do a fairly good job of burning it down, but the problem is, is usually the next year you're dealing with it again. Aminopyrrolid and picloram, again, it's not labeled in Kentucky, but I, I took into account that maybe some people were not from, uh, not from Kentucky might be here today. Uh, they do a really good job of controlling uh, ironweed even the next year after, after application. I could drive up through the middle of a tall ironweed field, make an application, and next year you'd come back and you'd see right where I drove <laughs> through the middle of your field. That's how long it, um, it lasts. Common cockleburr. Anybody ever heard of common cockleburr in here? Uh, it's just about taken over the past few years in Kentucky. Uh, best time to apply is uh, uh, prior to flower, but you want to get it early summer before you start putting on 
these birds, these birds. 2,4-D dicamba triclopyr, they all have activity on it. Residual herbicides really do a great job on it. Uh, so aminopyrrolid, clopyrrolid, and picloram. And by the way, if you look in your proceedings, I do have these particular active ingredients listed in there and the products that they can be found in. So if you're asking the question, where do I get aminopyrrolid, look in that proceedings book and it'll show you the product names for those. Buttercup. Buttercup has seemed to really be a problem in Kentucky for the past two, three years, hasn't it? It seems like it came on about three years ago and now we're just dealing with it constantly. Um, I've seen it in horse pastures and I don't know if you all have seen it in horse pastures, but a, a horse's face will blister from, from putting their face down into a, a field of, of uh, buttercup to graze the grass. So their face will actually blister when they try to, to get in and graze it. This is something you want to scout for early in the year. So you want to be on this in April, early April, out there looking for these leaves. Because once it gets to this stage, which is usually late April, early May, it's going to take a much bigger dose of herbicide to get control of that, and your, chance, your success will go down. 2,4-D dicamba do a great job of burning down existing plants. Aminopyrrolid and picloram are probably the best options for, for uh, soil residual activity. Pigweed species, uh, spiny amaranth, which you'll find in Kentucky quite a bit, but most of, uh, of all we're probably dealing with. Bill, is it usually red root pigweed? Common? You don't have red? It's smooth pigweed. The smooth pigweed, uh, I've seen it growing in, in several pastures, uh, in, uh, and especially along the edges of gardens, uh, the smooth pigweed. And then the spiny amaranth, you usually find it where you feed hay where you have a lot of trampling. That's where it likes to, to, uh, to hang out. 2,4-D dicamba are both pretty good on this particular species. Long-term control though, aminopyrrolid uh, and metsulfuron really, uh, anything with metsulfuron tends to hold this wheat out for longer periods of time. Aminopyrrolid by itself usually drops off, have something with metsulfuron in there, it'll actually hold that out much longer. Uh, sorry, Caroline horse nettle. It's supposed to be Carolina horse nettle. Uh, apply prior to flower in the late spring and, and early summer. Aminopyrrolid and picloram are by far the best actives on this. You can go out and apply non-residual herbicides, but usually you're going to deal with two or three flushes. Wild carrot. Uh, you get out the same time you start scouting for things like buttercup and, and common ragweed. If you look for wild carrot, it'll be you pull back the grass and you'll find wild carrot out there uh, in April. Uh, late April through early June are probably the best times to catch this before it actually puts on that, uh, that flower. Um, you should also have a second time because this is a biennial of catching it in September and October and getting control of it. And this is uh, probably the best thing out there to, to have in the tank is metsulfuron methyl uh, when it comes to getting control of wild carrot. Biennial thistles. Musk thistle in particular, uh, it tends to be really bad in the Midwest and with noxious weed laws, this is one that people are constantly going after. Um, burn down and uh, pretty good control can be achieved, in the, especially in the fall of the year with 2,4-D. So catching it when it's in a rosette and before it starts to bolt and that stock starts to, to, uh, to get put on. Uh, spring and, and also in the fall. but. Since the induction, introduction of aminopyrrolid, we have really hammered uh, musk thistle with, um, with those particular products. Picloram has also been really, really good on it. So tree and brush management. Tree and brush management is almost more of an art than it is a science in my opinion. Um, you've really got to have your ducks in the row if you want to go out and kill some weedy brush species with, with herbicide. Just as a general rule of thumb, uh, trees are f better controlled using broadcast herbicide or foliar applied herbicides if the leaf has fully expanded. Um, every year uh, I run into a producer that says, I, just as those leaves were starting to come out on that hedge tree or that locust tree, I sprayed it. I'm like, no, that's the wrong thing to do. You want those leaves to be fully expanded out so that way when you make that herbicide application, you maximize the amount of herbicides we get into those roots. All right. So having the mo as much leaf material out there as possible. Generally speaking, late June to mid-August is probably a good rule of thumb to adhere to in controlling brush. Not early in the spring, not late in the fall, but it's during the summertime. 
The other thing I would suggest is but you go in and you, you buy a herbicide and you want to get an adjuvant uh, to put in the tank with it, methylated seed oils are generally a bad idea. And here's the reason why. They can be so um, uh, destructive to the leaf material that it can defoliate a tree before we have time to get that herbicide in there. So using a non-ionic surfactant or maybe using some blends is probably a better way to go. Probably the biggest mistake I see people make is they mow and then they come back and they treat these little old seedlings thinking, wow, this is going to be so much easier to get control of. You've got a massive root system under the ground and you've got this little old stem that you're trying to get enough herbicide in to kill that stem. So a lot of times it's waiting and letting uh, brush regrow for about a year at least, a season of growth, before you ever try to make a herbicide application. This is probably the most common mistake I see people make with herbicides trying to control brush. True control can't be judged until at least the August of the next year. If you sprayed a tree in June of this year and you browned it out and you really felt good, went around beating your chest, I killed that tree, you better wait because that tree has the opportunity the entire next season to come back. All right? You can't judge tree control until at least a year after the application through the end of the following season. I've seen a lot of people take some real cheap herbicides, brown out a tree within just a week, and feel really good about themselves, only to find out that tree green right back up the next year. All right? The other thing I'll say about brush, you want at least 15 gallons of water per acre, if not more. There are two herbicides that I generally recommend, triclopyr and picloram. You usually have to have that somewhere in the tank. And this is for pastures. Uh, somewhere in the tank if you're going to get any tree control, one of those two or sometimes both. Um, but you're going to have to have that in the tank to get control of trees. The exceptions, buck brush. Buck brush, people try to spray buck, buck brush a lot of times too late. Buck brush will put on that leaf and it'll harden off and you can't get herbicide into it. 2,4-D is an excellent buck brush killer if you can get on those plants as soon as it leafs out. So we're talking about a lot of times early May, the first week of May, uh, you can do a really good job. If you put off control until late May or early June, something ha you ha whatever product you have in there, it better have some met sulfur on in there to help, uh, to help get control of that. And by the time you get to mid-June, uh, probably better postpone buck brush until uh, the following season. Multiflora rose. Coverage is key on multiflora rose. I have seen more multiflora rose come back because of poor coverage. They think they can hit one side of it or just the top. You've got to treat it like you're, you're trying to get an entire basketball wet. All right, <laughs> You need to get every bit of that foliage covered. Um, watch out for trying to mow and then treat them. It's just, um, it just does not work out. They need a year of regrowth. You can time this one. The, the, you have a very wide window by the time it starts to bloom in late May around here. Up until September, as long as it's got a good leaf on it, you can kill multiflora rose. Best I've seen on it are combinations of amino pyrrolid and triclopyr. Spot applications with triclopyr will do very well, but a broadcast application, I really like to have that amino pyrrolid or amino pyrrolid product in the tank with that triclopyr. Blackberry, this is another one people mess up on. Blackberry, you want blackberry to treat it as soon as the fruit drops off, so we're talking about late August. A lot of people, they try to treat it too early, and lo and behold, they find out that that blackberry is right back the next year. You want to catch it in the fall of the year, right after the fruit drop. Bill Klein, my good buddy out of Georgia, he said, if I can catch blackberry within three weeks of a killing frost and make an application, he said that'll be the best control that I'll ever get on blackberry. So that kind of gives you an idea on the timing. Again, coverage is key. A lot of times blackberry can get out of control on you very quickly. This is one that I say if you want to mow it, let it regrow until uh, the following year, you can get really good control on, uh, uh, or get over it a little easier and get control of it. And this is kind of show you, this is blackberry control one year after application with a, a product that we have called Chaparral. We applied it at two ounces with, and this has uh, amino pyrrolid and met sulfuron and pasture guard, which is triclopyr and fluoroxapyr. And so this was applied, um, this was mowed in 2012, this was applied in uh, October the 11th, 2012, and this is in 2013 in the summer. So 
by far gave us better results than mowing, but by waiting later in the year, that October time frame, did a good job on blackberry control. And then last but not least, this is probably the best tool I can give you, low volume basal bark treatments. Take something like Remedy Ultra, put 75% diesel fuel in there or a, a basal oil, specially formulated basal oil, treat the lower 15 inches of a tree, six inches in diameter or smaller, all the way around, that diesel fuel will soak that triclopyr into the cambium layer of that tree and you'll kill a tree. Proper application with this any time of year, as long as the bark's not frozen, I'm talking about I can do this in December, on a tree six inches or smaller, that tree's gonna die. It might start to leaf out next year, but after that, it's done. So, I told you I was gonna go through it fast. Any questions? Chris. It's called a hack and squirt treatment. And um, hack and squirt treatments, uh, I've seen more hack jobs done than I have good hack and squirt treatments. The, the hacks have to almost overlap. A tree is just a bundle of straws, the vascular system. And you can actually hack a tree right here, treat uh, with triclopyr or picloram, something like Tordon RTU, and you can watch leaves and limbs die on one side of the tree. So the thing is, it's very important to make sure that, that gets distributed all the way around the tree so those hacks need to at least overlap. Yes, sir, in the back. So the question is thorn bush, thorn bush, um, or uh, uh, something like a, uh, a locust. Yes, if they're six inches in diameter or smaller, that bark is usually thin enough. If you treat the lower 15 inches, and again, all the way around, lower 15 inches, that tree, you'll get control of it. So the question is, why is picloram not available in Kentucky? Tobacco. <laughs> uh, they never registered in Kentucky or Tennessee, and part of it was because of sensitive crops like tobacco. Yes, sir. Honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, uh, like we have around Lexington here, you see it growing up and down the interstates. Glyphosate is actually the best thing I've seen on, um, on honeysuckle, and catching it right now is the time frame. The first two weeks in October, coming out and treating that with glyphosate will actually get control of the bush honeysuckle better than anything I know of. You, you need to cover the whole thing, but it is very sensitive during that time frame. Well, well, the thing is, by doing it in October, you remember what I said about that time frame for treating brush being about mid-August, about when it ends? Right now, those leaves are going to fall off. If you were to get glyphosate on them, it's not going to have much of an effect on that tree. So having that two weeks of August, or October, first two weeks in October, is one of the reasons why we target during that time frame, because everything else around it is shutting down. Yes, sir. I sprayed uh, pasture guard this summer in chicory and horse metal. The plant will pull back in October, February. Mm -hmm. Yes, you probably will. Uh, Pasture Guard has triclopyr and fluoroxapyr. Neither one of them are fantastic on, on horse nettle especially. Chicory they're probably going to do all right on. But, yeah, you, you might want to either that or go ahead and plant your clover and deal with <laughs> what comes back. So the question is, how long after you treat a tree you, know, you cut it down? Uh, my good buddy Pat Birch in Virginia did this work a, a while back, and he said two months, two months of growing season. Now that doesn't mean you, 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 know, you treat it in November and then you cut it down in, in February. You, you really need to treat it and let it have two months of, of growing to actually, and if it's going to die, it's going to die in that two-month time frame, but at least give it two months. Can I ask one quick question? Yes. Cut So it, the question is about cut stump treatments, and, and that can be a very effective treatment, but you have to be careful. Early in the spring, trees tend to be bleeders. You cut them, and there's a lot of uh, uh, sap flow going up, and you can push a herbicide out. Remedy Ultra with diesel fuel or a basil oil, but it has to be oil-based, uh, sprayed on the top ring, that cambium layer, and the outside of that stump. If you do have root flow, it pushes the herbicide out, and it just soaks in on the outside of the stump. You can get really good control of trees that way. Some trees, like the bush honeysuckle, you want to have something else in there. They're prolific re-sprouters, 
but our common species maybe like hedge locusts, um, some of those we can do a pretty good job. If I've given the choice though and the tree's the right size, a basal bark treatment to me is the, the, the best low input treatment out there.